Good afternoon and welcome to the uh, College of Optical Sciences Colloquium Series, the last lecture for the spring semester of 2013. Um, today we're very lucky to have with us Philippe Jacot from our own uh, physics department. He's also a uh, faculty, uh, joint faculty here in optical sciences. Um, Professor Jacot is from Switzerland and he did his uh, diploma in theoretical physics at ETH and then he went on to University of Neuchâtel to work on his PhD. Um, his, uh, he got his PhD in 1997 from the University of Neuchâtel on, for works on quantum chaos and disordered electronic systems with interactions. Um, he did a postdoc at Yale from 97 to 2000 working on mesoscopic physics problems as well as optical microcavities and then another postdoc at the Lorentz Institute for Theoretical Physics in Leiden. Um, after that, he went to the University of Geneva, where he was an assistant professor from 2003 to 2005, and then I guess you came here, uh, 2005, 2006 time frame. And he's going to be speaking to us today about wave interference in random lasers. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. So, uh, as was just said, uh, I met, I uh, joined the University of Arizona about eight years ago now, and. Uh, became a member, a joint uh, member of this College of Optical Sciences three years ago. I haven't really visited the college yet. So, I mean, I'm very thankful that you give me this opportunity here, and I hope that, uh, well, this talk will uh, generate some uh, discussions. So, um, my love in physics research, first and foremost, is in uh, wave interferences. Actually, usually I call them quantum interferences. I'm interested in quantum mechanical systems. But, you know, these interferences are about the same in uh, optical systems or in other um, wave mechanical systems. They are ubiquitous. Um, and uh, recently, you know, it occurred to me that actually we know pretty much all about wave interferences in linear systems, but what happens when you have nonlinearities, when you have interactions, for instance, in a Bose-Einstein condensate or interactions in the context of solid state between electrons? Uh, what happens when you have nonlinearities arising, say, from pumping in lasers. And so that's that last aspect that I want to uh, uh, discuss a little bit uh, today. So um, that will be a re relatively long uh, general introduction part. And then by the end of this talk, I will tell you about you know, our uh, recent call for fame here. My main collaborator in this, in this endeavor is Peter Stano, who was my postdoc here at the University of Arizona. Uh, he's now in Basel on his way to, uh, to Japan. Okay, so, but let me start with, you know, basic things. Uh, what is a laser? So we know that this is an acronym that stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Um, and uh, it has three main components. It has uh, a, it consists in a resonator, there's an active medium, gain medium, and there is a pump. So what do these three components do? Well, the resonator's task is to trap light uh, long enough for gain to occur. Uh, the active medium is responsible for gain. So what is gain? You have a photon coming next to a two-level uh, system. So my you know, gain medium, if you really want to make it uh, at a, uh, a very, very basic fundamental level, you can model it as a two-level system. Well, if an electron is on the top uh, excited level here, the photon can actually uh, um, uh, you know, stimulate the uh, uh, transition of that electron down to the ground state, and there will be a second photon accompanying the first one. So that's stimulated emission. But then you need to make sure that there is uh, enough population of that electron in the excited state. So uh, how do you do that? Well, you have a pump, and the pump is uh, responsible to have a population inversion. More electrons in the excited state than in the ground state. This is not possible at equilibrium. Statistical mechanics tells us that. But if you have a pump, you're at non-equilibrium, and you can have this population inversion, uh, which actually uh, generates uh, lasing action. All right, so, so far so good. This is, this is well known. Uh, the conventional lasers uh, choose to have a resonator in the form of a fabry pair resonator, that is, two uh, mirrors opposite to each other. One of them is perfectly reflecting. The other one is imperfectly reflecting light bounces back and forth between these two mirrors, eventually it lases. Now you can close that resonator, end up with circular micro lasers, um, and uh, there the confinement of light is due to total internal reflection. It's basically the same. Think about 
this trajectory here as being generated by eight, or how many, how many bounces are there there? One, two, three, four, five, well, yeah, probably eight, uh, uh, appropriately placed uh, mirrors, that would be about the same thing. Okay, and you have an example here of one of these uh, circular micro lasers. All right, so that's the idealized picture. Now, what happens when we put impurities in there? So there's a conventional uh, wisdom in laser physics here that if you put impurities in your gain medium, for instance, you know, your gain medium is a crystal, and you have a dislocation in that crystal, or you have an atom that should be there and is not there, you have a wrong type of atom that is there, and so on, well, then light bouncing back and forth between these two mirrors is every now and then going to hit uh, that impurity, and ph photons will be scattered out of the cavity. So you will lose this photon. And that is not very good for lasing action, right? Because, well, lasing action, I show you here a plot of the output power versus the uh, pumping intensity. Um, lasing action occurs, you know, once you put enough pump that there is more gain than losses. So if you increase the losses, you will need more gain, so you will need more pump. Okay, and you will have a lasing threshold at a higher pump energy, you will have a less efficient laser. So the conventional wis wisdom in laser physics is that disorder is bad uh, because of losses. And, uh, well, we know that. And uh, they know that in galaxies far, far away where lasers are even used to actually restore order uh, when order is not uh, there. All right, so, so far, so good. This is the conventional wisdom in laser physics. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm trying to explain my kids that this is not possible because light would continue to fly and cannot stop somewhere, but they don't want to understand that. Well, anyway, so um, given all this, given this need for order to have good lasing action, what, what, what is this title? What, what does that mean to have a random laser. I mean, something that is random is totally disorganized, it's disordered, it's, it's the opposite of order. And so I'm going to spend some time to explain to you what is a random laser and why, why I believe this is, this is an interesting problem. Uh, there is a lot of interest from the point of view of applications, but I'm not going to discuss applications too much here today. I'm, I'm, I'm here motivated by, you know, in the intellectual aspect of, of random lasing. So, uh, Let's look at what is a random laser. Uh, again, here you have this conventional laser, and here there is a sketch of this uh, random type of laser. In a conventional laser, uh, photons bounce back and forth, back and forth sorry, between two uh, mirrors. And uh, when they spend enough time in there, they can exit, because one of the mirrors is, perfectly, is not perfectly reflecting. And because they spend a lot of time in there, they had time to multiply. That's gain. Could we get this gain without having these two mirrors? And it was a suggestion by a Russian physicist Letokov in, uh, in the late 60s to consider instead of a gain medium with confinement, let's take a gain medium, let's remove the confinement, but let's put a lot of disorder in there. Now, what does disorder do for you? Well, if you have no disorder, a photon that is emitted here will just fly off ballistically. And the time it takes him to get out of the, of the cavity is going, of the gain medium is going to be very short, of the order of, well, the size of the cavity divided by the speed of light. Well, the speed of light with the uh, index of refraction there inside, but that's, that's very fast. So you don't spend much time inside the cavity, inside the gain medium, and you don't have time to multiply. Well, instead, you can put a lot of scatterers. And each time... Uh, a photon hit a scatterer, it is reflected, it is scattered in one or another direction. The trajectory that you have then becomes diffusive, and diffusive trajectories take a long, long time, much longer time to get out of a disordered regions than ballistic trajectories do. There is a prefactor in the time it takes to get out in the length of the trajectory, which is proportional to, well, the system size divided by the elastic mean free path, that's the distance between uh, the average distance, let's say, between two uh, of these impurities. Okay, so if the, the elastic mean free path is very short, that prefactor is very large, and then you have very long trajectories, and your photons are going to have enough time to actually, you know, make use of the gain, multiply, you will have 
starting from one photon two, then four, then eight, and so on. And you have this exponential explosion of the number of photons. Maybe this will give rise to lasing. That's basically what Letokov said back in those days. And now you have to realize one thing here is that until now I haven't mentioned anything about phase matching. So if you want, this argument about diffusion here would work about as well if I were making it for the intensity of the field as if I were making it for the field itself. So that means, you know, in terms of quantum mechanics, I'm, I can talk about the squared amplitude of the wave function or the wave function itself. I've neglected here any quantum interference effect, any wave interference effect uh, so far. Okay, so this is, this is a proposal. This is a theoretical proposal from the late 60s. So, well, it can be right, it can be wrong. Proved to be actually right. And, you know, in physics, well, in quantum optics also, uh, we know that something is right, a theory is right, when it is experimentally demonstrated. And so they did that back in 94, this group here. Uh, they took a lasing dye. So it, it's, it's a liquid solution that, you know, is a gain medium, if you want. And they pumped it. And if they have just the lasing dye, uh, what they find is this curve here, that's this, this, this curve. Okay, that's a curve of the emission versus wavelengths. You measure what's the light that comes out of your experiment, what is its spectrum, what is the, emi the, the intensity of that, of that emission of light uh, as a function of the wavelengths. Then they did another thing. They put scatterers in it. So it's a, it's a you know, liquid solution. You can put some small nanograins. And it's easy to put nanograins there, and actually you can you know, change the density of the nanograins. You can put some of them, make your experiment, put more of them, redo the experiment, see how lasing, well, if lasing occurs and how it is influenced by the density of scatterers that you have here. Okay, so you put some scatterers there. You pump. At some small pump, you know, 2.2 millijoules is about 20% less than what I had before without the scatterers. And you have this curve here. Note, however, that this curve has been, you know, to be put on that figure, it has, you know, its amplitude in the vertical direction, uh, um, the vertical scale has been multiplied by 10. So in principle, it should lie down here somewhere. But we wouldn't see it. Okay, so there is very, very low emission there. But then, you, cr you crank up the pump, and 3 microjoules is what you had before, and you have this very narrow emission peak here, and the scale here in this time has been divided by 10. So this guy should be, well, whatever, very high up here. So you have a magnification of the emission intensity. And, well, the claim is that this is lasing. And in what sense is this lasing? Well, you can look also at the uh, um, um, narrowness of this peak. That's a, that's a, a usual indication of lasing action. How narrow is this big P emission peak here? And you see that past some pumping threshold, the uh, width of that peak uh, uh, goes down. And it goes down rather abruptly. So people believe that, you know, here, well, you have different samples with different uh, density of scatterers in there, but you have lasing action. And that lasing action, again, one of the main features is that at 3 microjoules, if you have no scatterer, you have a standard broad emission here. If you have scatterer, you have a very narrow peak with an, with an emission intensity that shoots up by a factor of 10 or more. And this is related so to the scatterer, to that you know, scattering phenomenon. So this is one of the main features of random lasers. You have to demonstrate that lasing is actually due uh, to uh, the density of your scatterers. And I think it was nicely demonstrated here. Now, you see in the title to this slide, I say incoherent feedback. And to me, it's a bit of a semantic distinction that people make here. But, you know, it is believed that here, wave coherence plays little, if any, uh, <coughs> if any uh, um, uh, role. Oh, basically, because if you look at the lasing peak, it's still many, many, uh, uh, well, it's, it's still too broad, actually. It's not narrow enough. You probably have a lot of different modes that lays at... Uh, uh, that are covered by this lasing peak. So, 
what is coherent feedback now then? And I would like to spend this slide to try to qualitatively explain you what would be the difference between a coherent or an incoherent feedback laser uh, based on my microscopic way of looking at things here. So if you have a laser where uh, a photon stops somewhere and then diffuses and goes out of the sample and you can neglect uh, you know, loops that this uh, diffusion uh, uh, trajectory would do, you can neglect diffraction of waves that would then you know, recombine at some place, you know, some sort of double slit exp uh, experiment. This is how a wave interferes. Uh, if you can neglect that, then you have incoherent feedback. And now in those experiments, these are three-dimensional systems, so you have a lot of freedom to go one way without coming back to where you were before. So it was kind of believed that you know, this type of interferences do not matter. Now on the other hand, and here I'm taking for good purposes a two-dimensional system, if your trajectory diffuses, but then come back to where it was some time ago, well, then you see that it comes back with some phase, and if this, space, if, if this phase difference is a multiple of 2 pi, you have a constructive interference, and if it is a not multiple of pi, then you will have a destructive interference. And then if you have many different paths that come back with random phase differences, you average over all these different phases, and you get zero. So you won't have any lasing in that case. Okay, so that's the, the, the main point here, if you want to look at incoherent versus coherent laser, is to see whether return probabilities play a role uh, in your lasing action here. And so you see, when you do that, you have to go a little bit beyond the Tokov's arguments. You have to think in terms of photon amplitude, field amplitude. And then, once you get them, you square them, and you get all the, interfer uh, the interference terms. OK, so was coherent feedback random lasing demonstrated? And the answer is yes. It took five more years. Uh, it was done by uh, um, these two, these two uh, uh, groups here, the group of uh, Valli Vardeni in Utah and uh, the group of, uh, I forgot who it was at Northwestern, uh, but who itself was the first author. She's now at Yale, uh, still working on random lasers and many other things. OK, anyway, uh, these are uh, some figures of random lasers. You can have these uh, nano rods here. Um, that are, you know, aligned here, but, you know, some, some sort of irregular pattern. Or you can have this aggregate here, uh, some zinc oxide, uh, small grains that are put together. And, um, well, if you pump these materials here, eventually you get lasing. You get, you know, from a low pump, that black curve, you get a higher pump with some uh, peak that starts to laze here for the green curve. And as you crank up your pumping, you get more and more modes lasing. Actually, these lasers can be multi-mode. And you see that these peaks, uh, these emission peaks, are very narrow. They are much narrower, at least by a factor of 10, if not more than those of the experiment by Lawandi that I showed before. OK, so it is believed that here you have a single mode that is, that is lasing, that resolves, and that is not directly, uh, well, broadened to another uh, nearby lasing mode. So modes are, modes are uh, <clears throat> how should I say this, uh, they are resolved here. And here, you know, you have the extreme example where you have this very flat background, noisy but flat, and then you have this very, very narrow peak here. Um, and that, that clearly indicates lasing action. So in this case, you know, you, you shouldn't think of a random laser as something like that, where you have a mode that actually shoots its light in one direction, like my pointer does. It's, you know, if you look at this uh, um, um, far field picture of, of this grain, what you see is that you have emission from basically everywhere, or mostly everywhere around the grain, and it goes in more or less all directions, with more or less intensity in one or the other direction. So there is some directionality, which is basically random, uh, but it's lazing in the sense of a well-defined mode, and in the sense that, you know, past a certain threshold, you have a very large, very sharp increase in the output intensity. So these are, you know, the two characteristics which make people believe that this is true lazing action. 
All right, so far so good. So as of now, we know that we have random lasers here, that there's coherent feedback, there's incoherent feedback. And this is all mostly experimental here, except for Letokov's argument. Now, what happens uh, if you, you know, publish this type of results? Well, what you have is that you have terrorists joining the gang. Right? It's, it's actually uh, mind-blowing. How comes this? Is, is this truly a laser? And if yes, in what sense? So the, the first question you may want to ask is this. Okay, it smells like lasing. You are uh, convinced by the fact that, uh, well, you have a narrow peak. You have this... Uh, uh, output threshold, so why not lasing? But then, how do we get gain? Okay, what are the long-lived modes that you need to have in principle uh, to be able to accumulate gain and start lasing really with this narrowness uh, of the resonance? And so there were a number of answers that came over the years, and you know I, I'm, I'm listing some of them, but there cer certainly were others also. And, uh, you know, to have a more complete picture of what happened, I'm, I'm referring you to these two uh, nice reviews on random lasers, and there are others also. <clears throat> so possible answers include the following. Uh, the first answer that came to mind is the following. Here, you have this very narrow peak. And narrowness of the peak means that somewhere you must have one of these phase matching conditions that the intensity of the light, well, not the intensity, the, 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 the field comes back to itself, and it must come back with a phase that is a multiple of 2 pi. Otherwise, there will be some destructive interferences, and you won't laze. You have, if, if you want, in a sense, you have a quantization condition for your lasing mode. So there's coherence. And, uh, well, people started to look at what coherent effect could give you long-lived mode. And the first, co the first idea that comes to mind that was explained, that was proposed by these guys, is that you have Anderson localized modes. And I will tell you later what is an Anderson localized mode. It's something that happens uh, in disordered quantum mechanical systems. Um, if you have these localized modes, you have these disordered systems. Some modes are localized here. They leak out very little, so they have a long lifetime. And so they have all the time in the world to actually you know, take advantage of the gain, have ph photon multiplication, and eventually start to laze. OK, other, other um, um, suggestions included lucky photons. So suddenly you have some special trajectory, non-generic trajectory, which is anomalously long where photons can stay, and they can stay long enough to actually uh, take advantage of the gain. Uh, you had pre-localized modes. So I mean, this type of uh, suggestions here came after people realized that the disorder strength, the elastic mean free path, if you want, in those systems was too large to actually uh, lead to Anderson localization. So this was, this was a very good suggestion, but it was not directly applicable, or so they thought, to this type of system. OK, so then you need to find something that localizes your, sta your states. And uh, these guys here, Apalkov, Reich, and Shapiro, uh, propose that you know, if you have a disordered system, you also have anomalously localized states. Even though the disorder is not too strong, you know, most of the states would be delocalized. But some of them would be you know, more compressed by the disorder. And these are, anyway, those that matter for lasing action, because only those have a sufficiently long lifetime to actually start to laze. OK, and that's when you know, the theory started to blow up. People even said that delocalized state could do the job. And you, know, you have several of these scenarios that could, that could actually, um, 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 actually coexist, and so on and so forth. I'm not going to go through each of these suggestions and tell you which one is the right one. Actually, I believe that now there is a broad range of different random lasers. And you know, they act in different regimes of disorder. And I think that in certain of these uh, random lasers, certain of these uh, suggestions work. And in others, you have other mechanisms. So it, it's no longer a question of whether one of these guys is wrong. It's, it's a question of what type of laser am I interested in? Am I interested in a very strongly disordered laser? In which case, I can restrict myself to considerations of Anderson localized modes. 
And that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to consider only very strongly, localized, strongly disordered systems. OK, so now it's, it's high time I, I tell you a little bit about localization and what happens when you take a quantum mechanical system or a wave mechanical system and you put a lot of disorder in it. Um, OK, so by the way, if you have questions, do not, do not hesitate to, to interrupt me. All right, so uh, let me give you just a quick scratch course on uh, waves in random media. That's, that's how this, this field is called, wave in random media, wave propagation in random media. Uh, when you have a relatively strongly disordered system, you have multiple scattering. Okay, so let's say I want to send a particle from point A to point B. And I can do that via a direct trajectory here. But, you know, I may have an impurity here and some impurities there that would also force my particle to actually make a loop. Or the loop could be traversed in the clockwise or the counterclockwise direction. Now, what wave mechanics or quantum mechanics tells us is that if I want to calculate the probability to be at C, well, I have to uh, sum coherently the probability, well, the amplitude, to be at C given that I go clockwise along that loop plus uh, the amplitude to go counterclockwise about that loop. Once I sum them, I square the amplitude. And because, you know, in this particular case, my, it, it, it doesn't change anything that I go clockwise or anti-clockwise. It's the same trajectory inverted. That's a system that we call in physics time reversal symmetric. Well, what happens by the end of the day is that I have a factor of four for the amplitude uh, for the probability to stay, uh, to stay at C. Four times A squared. A squared is the probability to be at C given that I go clockwise, for instance. If I had a classical particle, I would have two times A squared, not four. So there is a doubling of the probability to be at C. That means I have a reduction of the probability to go to B. And that's the essence. That's what you need to know about uh, basically this quantum coherent effect. Interferences are going to reduce the probability to be transmitted. And here I have a formula that we use in, in, in condensed matter physics to look at uh, corrections to the conductance. Basically, this integral here gives you the probability that, well, you would take a, a particle that would have a uh, wavelength lambda f here. So that's a tube uh, that, would, that has a cross-section of lambda f squared in three dimension. And that's the probability that this tube actually goes back to itself by diffusion. And then you integrate over all times, and that gives you the correction to the conductance. Anyway, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Just I want to mention one thing, that these corrections can be destroyed, and they can be destroyed very efficiently if you just, for instance, have electrons, they have a charge, and you uh, pierce this loop with the magnetic flux. Then instead of this 4a squared that we had before, you have 2a squared times 1 plus cosine of the flux. Cosine of the flux is smaller than 1, so you have a reduction of the probability to stay here. And now, because all the loops will have different, uh, will cover different areas, I apply a magnetic field. The flux is the area times the field. This phi here will have a distribution. If I average a cosine over a distribution, eventually the cosine disappears. So I recover the classical probability. All right, that's not of much importance here for optics where photons are not charged and it's hard to actually devise an experiment with a uh, magnetic flux in that case. But I just wanted to mention this. Actually, there is this interesting parallel that I find between optics on the right-hand side and electronics on the, on the, on the left-hand side for these corrections. What we measure is what is called weak localization that tends to reduce the probability to transmit an electron. So that's truly this diagram as I showed it before. And its trademark is when you measure the conductance and you apply a magnetic field, that's what you have on the horizontal axis, then the conductance increases because you kill this interference effect. This loop no, no longer contributes to the reduction of the conductance. In optics, what you have on the other hand, it's a phenomenon that is called coherent backscattering. It's, it's very close to it, right? Here you also see some sort of loop, right, for this trajectory. It's basically a measure here, backscattering, that's the, this peak here. That's a measure as a function of the mismatch in the angle, in the reflection angle of 
of your photon. Uh, if the photon, if you look at the reflection of the photon in the same angle that you injected it, then you see that you have a doubling of the probability to observe it. And as you move away with the angle, you see that in the end you get just the classical probability to be reflected. So these are truly the two same phenomena in electronics and in optics. Okay, and if you want to hear more about it, to learn more about it, there's a very interesting book by uh, Erika Kermans here and, uh, and Gilles Montembeau. All right, now weak localization is called weak because it's the pre precursor to strong localization. That's the thing I'm interested in here. It has been uh, proposed by Phil Anderson a long time ago already. Uh, and basically, it's the following. Uh, take a disordered system. So I have this potential, and this potential is, is, is random. Let, let me put it random. I can do that mathematically. And there are ways to do that physically also. In optical systems, people use speckle uh, patterns to actually do that, but I'm not going to go into this. Now, the question that Anderson asks is the following. If I take a classical particle, and that particle is an energy that is far above that potential, well, we know that it's going to be transmitted. Right? It's not going to be blocked by, by this potential. But if instead I put a quantum particle there, what is the answer? Can it be transmitted? Its energy is much larger than you know, the fluctuations of this potential. Can it still be transmitted? Or what will happen? Now, if you want to you know, get uh, an idea of what will happen, why not start by saying, well, let me instead consider a particle that would be here inside. Classically, we know what would happen. It would be trapped here. So you, ha you would have classical localization. But quantum mechanically, well, that particle could tunnel out. We know that there is something called a tunnel effect in quantum mechanics. It could leak out on the left and right hand side. So if anything, in quantum mechanics, you would be more delocalized than in classical mechanics. Right? That's, that's what you would guess based on this analogy here. And that's not what happened. Because even if your energy is far above, if you're in one or in two dimension and you have this random potential, eventually when the size of the system is large enough, your wave function is going to be exponentially localized. So that would be, well, that's a plot I have here. On a log scale, you plot your wave function components, and you see that you have this exponential decay on both sides of that wave function. That's a simulation I did ages ago. Uh, I could do much better now, but you know, I just figured out I could, might as well take that, that figure. <coughs> OK, so if your wave functions are exponentially localized, you try to inject an electron from the left. Well, it's going to be projected on one of these wave functions or two. It will follow the wave function, go about as far as the wave function goes, and then it will stop. It will stop because the wave function is exponentially localized. So that's Anderson localization. Um, it's always like that in one and two dimension. And the claim is truly that if you take a system that is big enough, uh, no matter how weak the disorder is, and if the disorder is very weak, you would need perhaps to take a bigger system, well, all the wave functions are going to be exponentially localized in that system, in one and two dimension. In three dimension, there is something weird. There is, some, so, some, uh, there is a, a critical disorder strength above which uh, all the states are localized, below which some states are delocalized, some states are localized. Three dimension is, well, a bit different from two and one dimension. And why is that so? Well, remember what I, 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 talked, I, I told you about uh, weak localization. You have these loops where a trajectory comes back to itself. It's very hard to have a loop in three dimension. In two dimension, it's easy to get it. In one dimension, I mean, you know, you come back to where you were all the time. But in three dimension, it's much harder. And that's the essence, basically, of, of the thing. OK, so this is all there is to say if you have a linear system, quantum mechanical linear system. What happens if you have a nonlinear system? Well, I want to apply this to lasers, so why not first start with a linear system but with gain? So I'm going to, instead of considering a Hermitian problem, I'm going to consider a non-Hermitian problem. That was done some time ago in the mid-90s. Um, these two people here, David Nelson and his collaborator, uh, 
they were looking at some problem of in superconductivity, and they came up with a Hamiltonian that has an imaginary vector potential. You see that I here, if you don't have I, this is a vector potential that mimics a standard magnetic field. But you have the I here. So you have an imaginary vector potential there. And they looked at that problem. And what they found, is written here, is that in one and two dimension, this is going to delocalize certain states. Now, how does it work? I mean, there is a hand-waving argument to find how this works, and it is the following. If you have this imaginary vector potential, your Hamiltonian is no longer Hermitian, so your energy eigenvalues are no longer uh, real. And so if you look at the time evolution, what you get is that, well, you get a, uh, an a complex exponential times a real exponential with the imaginary part of your energy eigenvalue. Now, if the imaginary part is positive, you have amplification. And that amplification can actually beat, well, it actually does beat in the long time limit, the exponential damping uh, with Anderson localization. So that's what this thing does, and there is a critical, uh, uh, well, there are some states that, uh, you know, capture enough um, uh, imaginary part in their uh, energy eigenvalue to actually be delocalized. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to skip some details here because this argument doesn't work if you have an imaginary uh, scalar potential. It works for vector potential. That's a nice reason for that, but I'm not going to tell you about it. Okay, so if we have gain, still a nonlinear problem, but gain in the form of an imaginary uh, vector potential, for instance, non-emission quantum mechanics, we would expect to be able to beat Anderson localization. But that's not quite what we have in a laser. In a laser, we have gain, but we have nonlinearity. So I want to look at the full problem here. And because I'm not sure that I will be able to actually give you a taste of everything that we did, let me uh, jump to the take-home message here. So this is, this is the answer to the, to, to the question. What happens if you have a random laser that is very disordered? In the absence of pump, you would look at the modes. They are all Anderson localized and then you start pumping them. What would, would the lasing modes look like? And so this is this figure that we showed in that paper that actually, I, I think, carries most of the message. So D here is the strength of the pump, and what I'm plotting here on the horizontal axis, uh, we have a one-dimensional cavity, so one-dimensional random laser, and that's the coordinate, the spatial coordinate along that cavity. On this side, I have a perfectly reflecting mirror. On that side, it's open and I can lace. My cavity has a, uh, an index of refraction that fluctuates from place to place. That's my disorder. Okay. And I pump it. And these are the lasing modes that I see at some pump, d equal to 0 0.04 in some units. Okay. So what I have here is what? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Seven lasing modes. We see that they are all exponentially localized with some distribution of the localization length. This is a logarithmic scale. And these are all lasing modes. Lasing modes in the sense that, you know, you can look at the emission spectrum and you will see narrow line at the frequency corresponding to those guys. Now, there's one thing that is actually pretty interesting here is that if you look at the brown mode and the red mode, they are right on top of one another. This is, this is a an amazing figure that we found, you know, by chance, but it really, it really sees something. The two modes here are on top of one another. And you would not expe expect that. Why would you not expect that? If the two modes are there at the same spot, well, if they laze, they have to feed on the same gain medium. Now, usually what happens is that one of them wins and the other one doesn't laze. And that's a nonlinearity phenomenon which is called... Uh, uh, spatial hole burning. Spatial hole burning because if you have a lasing mode, well, it creates a hole in the gain medium that other modes cannot enter. Okay, there's no gain medium for other modes there. Well, here it seems that spatial hole burning is not working very well from what we can say. What happens when we crank up the pump? Do this mode change? Well, we crank up the pump by a factor of 10. We plot all the modes. So you have all these dashed modes. There are four or five of them. These are the new modes that were not there before. They started to laze now. Some of them overlap 
Well, many of them overlap with one or the other or several of the already existing glazing modes. And yet they don't change the profile. I mean, you see that the amplitude has changed. Look at the vertical scale, right? This is a nonlinear problem with pump. So I mean, the modes, you don't normalize them. The normalization tells you how many photons are populating those modes. OK, but you see that the shape, look at the, at the red guy here, it's the same shape as before. The brown guy has the same shape as before. These two guys still overlap exactly as they did before. Well, but one of the guys, the brown guy, actually managed to beat the red guy. It's catching up. It's, it's, it's feeding better on the, on the photons than the red guy for some reason which we don't know. That's just what comes out of our code here. And that's the message to take home. What we see here is that, well, I could show you the same modes for the non-lasing cavity. These are modes of the non-lasing cavity. And I can crank up the pump, and they don't change. And they can overlap. And the only thing that the nonlinearity in the laser does is that it decides, well, this mode here is going to laze, and another one that was there, well, this one is not going to laze. But other than that, once a mode lays, well, it is what it is, what it was already in the cold cavity without pump, and it will remain the same forever. OK, so now that's, that's the take home message. Um, I'm uh, at 45 minutes. How much time do I have left? Five to 10 minutes is, would be good. OK, so I'm going to you know, try to give you a taste of you know, how you can understand this. And you know, to do that, I need to go into some technical details here. So I'm going to do that during five or 10 minutes. I will try not to get too boring here. So what is the model that we have for this laser? So as I said, you need to have a confinement. You need to have a pump. Um, and you need to have a gain medium. So we have a cavity which has a certain index of refraction. Uh, I have two level atoms in there. And then I have a pump that creates a population inversion in these two level atoms. And then I have to take into account the fact that I have a population inversion, an electric field, and a polarization field that are coupled. Now, the standard way to look at these things is called semi-classical. Semi-classical in the sense that the electromagnetic field are going to be classical. And the uh, gain medium, the two level system, is going to be quantum mechanical. And so you, when you do that, this has been done long ago. I didn't do it. It's the subject of textbooks. Uh, you, get with, you, you, you end up with this set of three coupled equations, partial differential equations. Uh, you may recognize that the first one is basically a Maxwell equation, well, or field equation, or um, a wave equation from the Maxwell equations. Uh, and the second and third equations couple the polarization field and the uh, <coughs> the electric field and the uh, 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 population inversion to, uh, to, uh, to each other via the uh, uh, dipole matrix element of the two-level system. Uh, and the other parameters you have in your system, you have damping rates here of the polarization, a damping rate here uh, of the population inversion that just tells you, you know, if I excite one electron, how long, on average, will it take for that electron to relax to the ground state and emit a photon if I had no other field there? Spontaneous emission. OK, and omega naught here is the frequency between uh, my two-level system. I have n of x, which is the index of refraction. Now, the problem is the following. This is a set of three coupled partial differential equation. There is absolutely no hope that you can solve this thing exactly. No hope. You cannot do even, you know, you cannot even start to think that you can do something analytical. I mean, that is well controlled. So what people do usually is that they time evolve this, this equation. It's very time consuming. Uh, and they get lazy. Now, there is a theory that was developed some time ago that I liked a lot by uh, Arkham Turecci and Dark Stone, which actually says the following. We can say something a bit more. We can at least simplify the problem a bit if we consider the steady state situation. So what is steady state? You would pump the laser. It would start to laze, and the emission would be constant in time. Well, what that means is that you have a derivative of the population inversion and of the polarization that is equal to 0. 
Okay, so if these two are equal to zero, you can set the uh, left-hand side of these equations equal to zero. You can solve here for P and E, inject it there, uh, uh, and get an equation for D. Oh, sorry, what do I want? An equation for E. So you solve for P and D, and you get an equation for E. Okay, so you will get basically this equation here for the electric field equal to zero, because I also want the electric field to be sort of constant. Uh, but I will have an additional term that will come from solving for P via these two equations there. Okay. Uh, let me skip this here. There are some assumptions about, you know, what you need to solve this. But basically, by the end of the day, you get just this equation here. So you see, it's, it's, it's just like a, a Helmholtz equation, a wave equation here on the left-hand side, except on the right-hand side, you have this, this, this whole prefactor here factor depending on frequencies and parameters in your system and God knows what, you don't need to look at all the details here. But what matters is to realize that you have this thing here. H of x is a function that depends on the lasing mode. So you have here an equation for the lasing modes that will determine what is H of x that will determine what is the lasing mode. So you have a self-consistent equation. You've simplified your three partial differential equation to a single partial differential equation, but with some self-consistency. So it's a bit simpler. You have just one quantity, this psi mu here, which is basically the amplitude of the, the electric field, uh, to solve for, but you still have this self-consistency. So it's, it's, it's an improvement. This can be fed to a computer still, and it works better and faster. You don't need to make all the time evolution and wait until you reach steady state, but it's not a fantastic improvement. So now I see that there are a number of students in the audience. Here, when you're faced with a hard problem like that, I mean, you should never be shy of trying to solve a very hard problem. But, you know, don't try and, you know, solve a problem that is too hard and spend your life trying to solve it, and one day you will die thinking that you solved it, but who knows? Right? Instead, you should try to find a hard problem and solve it in an easy limit. That's, how, that, that's where you should start. Because if you, f if you solve your hard problem in some easy limit, you have a starting point. Then you can move away from that easy solution in that easy regime. And the easy regime for that equation here, it turns out, is the Anderson localized regime. So put a lot of disorder in your problem, and I'm going to try to show you how this thing can be easily solved. So to do that, I'm just going to, re to you know, go from this uh, uh, differential equation to a linear equation, but still with self-consistency. I need to expand my guys here onto a basis. So that's a modal de de decomposition that will be very helpful later on. And then I have this matrix equation. Uh, a mu has to be equal to a matrix multiplying A mu. A mu are the coefficients to my, the basis of the fields that I decide to choose. And if I have the A mu, I have all the information I need about the lasing mode. Principally, it would be very easy, except that this matrix here depends self-consistently on the solution to that equation. And you have you know, a set of equations like that with mu equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, as many lasing modes you have. So still, you have to do it numerically. Let us look at this matrix T. And that's about the, the last technical detail I will give. If you take this matrix T, it splits into a prefactor, which is a diagonal matrix. There's this delta Kronecker there, times another matrix. All these prefactors, forget about them. What matters is here. Here you have a frequency, which is the true real frequency of the lasing field, minus a, not a frequency, but this frequency is the frequency of my cold cavity modes. And these cold cavity modes leak out. So they have an imaginary part of their frequency. So this is why, in principle, this denominator is never equal to 0. But if you have Anderson localization, the imaginary part here is going to be very, very small because the lifetime is very, very long, because you're exponentially localized and the boundary of your system is here. So you just have an exponential tail that leaks out. And so in that case, this denominator can be exponentially <coughs> exponentially large for some frequencies. And in that case, you can show, and I'm not going to do, I'm just going to skip the, 
next three or four slides, I'm running out of time, you can show that then you can solve this equation with great accuracy with only constructing your lasing modes out of a single of these cold cavity modes that you chose to start with. It's just this denominator here. Okay, so I had some explanation here, but I'm going to skip them. And uh, let me go again through my results. These are the results for my lasing system. So again, well, this is no longer cavity size. This is the pump, the pump strength. So I start at some very small pump, and then I start to have modes lasing. So you see the output intensity goes up. It goes up fast, but this is, a, you know, it's because uh, I have a, a logarithmic scale, and then it levels off, and it continues linearly. And now what you see is that all these la lasing modes, I plot here uh, what is their extension, basically, and it doesn't change at all. It's flat. It's the, it's, it, these are some of the most boring figures you can think of. We had to put a lot of color in it to actually, you know, attract the attention of people to them. But, you know, these are just a bunch of flat lines. And you change the pump by one, two, three, four, the magnitude, nothing happens. You look at the center of mass of these modes, they stay the same. Or look at this red and brown curve here. These are the red and brown modes that I discussed before. They stay together. They don't move. They don't change. Frequency, lasing frequency, always the same. No change at all. And this is all because of this very small denominator that actually boosts one contribution and makes a you know, single mode approximation valid. This is a figure I already showed you before, so I'm not going to discuss this. Well, these red and brown modes are, are really here, so they don't change a lot, uh, at all. <coughs> and um, I'm going to skip this too to finally discuss if this is of any experimental relevance? And the answer is yes. You know, I told you at some point, may have a theory. If the theory is not confirmed by experiments, you know, you forget the theory, you do better. Well, here, you know, when we were completing this, this, uh, this uh, uh, paper, you know, I had discussions with uh, uh, Jonathan Andreasen here, and he drew my attention to that paper here. Now, if you look at these guys, you know, they have these small grains here. This is some uh, semiconductor that actually you know, can be considered as, uh, well, they're a random laser. Uh, the circle here shows you where they pump it, and then they look at the emission spectrum as a function of pump strength. And what you see is that you have a peak here, a blue peak, a red peak, and this peak doesn't move in frequency. You have other experiments where you actually see that the peaks move in frequency. Some peaks disappear, some other peaks start, start to laze. You have all kind of behavior that happens. But here it doesn't, and we believe that this is due to you know, our Anderson localization thing, because if you look at the disorder that they have here, it's characterized by the ratio of the uh, uh, elastic mean free part to the wavelength, it's close to one. And that's called the Jofek uh, regal threshold. Below that, you have true Anderson localization in this three-dimensional system. So we think that's what was witnessed there. That's, that's just a um, <coughs> trademark of Anderson localization. And more recently, there was this other paper here. So they have these photonic waveguides. This time, it's in one dimension. Uh, there's some lateral disorder. And they see that you know, these, are, these are the lasing modes. They, they visualize them as a function of the position and of, as a function of the frequency. And you see that there are many guys with different frequencies that overlap, especially here, here, and there. And when we saw that, we contacted those guys. And here is the answer that they gave in their email. In analyzing our experiment, we were rather surprised about the lack of mode competition. And the only explanation we could think of was that it, uh, um, it was because we had very localized modes that are not overlapping. However, now it seems that uh, your work gives us a much, much more plausible and surprising explanation. So we were very happy to get that email exchange with these people. Um, we wish them good luck for publishing this. It seems they have a problem. <laughs> so wait. And, uh, and all right. So I mean, I think that's, that's, the end of, uh, that's the end of what I wanted to tell you. Oh, let me quote another thing. This is, this is a quote from a referee report we got. You know, a good, a good uh, story about you know, publishing papers would not be complete without some uh, refereeing uh, comments. So here, what we have is this. The main result of the paper and the review consists in the statement that if modes of a random laser are strongly Anderson localized, 
the nonlinear interaction between different modes becomes suppressed. So you got it right until now. While this statement is definitely correct, it is not at all surprising. Indeed, all nonlinear interactions are determined by overlap integrals. In Anderson localized regime, these integrals are exponentially small because wave functions of, differ uh, uh, of different localized modes do not overlap this well. What he says is that lasing modes are here, 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 never at the same place. So just an exponentially small overlap does not matter. And our answer is no. Just look at the red and the brown mode here. That's you know, a, contra a contradiction to uh, that statement there. OK, so it's time for me to conclude here. And to conclude, I would just like to make the, 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 the following statement. So in uh, recent years, months, we hear a lot about uh, the Higgs boson. And that may give you the impression that all there is to do in physics is about understanding the Higgs boson, finding it, and so on. Now, from a theoretical point of view, Higgs boson is 1960s physics. It's 50 years old. And I believe that there are many, many more things to be discussed and to be investigated in physics than just this type of problem. So far, we've been following the spherical cow in theoretical physics, the spherical cow paradigm, which says that basically, well, take a system and simplify it. A cow, well, it's a sphere. We've been considering systems that are linear, non-interacting, at equilibrium, ordered, uh, and so on, local. But in real life, when you do quantum mechanics, when you do wave mechanics, you realize that most systems are non-linear. They have interactions. Well, they're interacting. They are often at, away from equilibrium. They are disordered. They are non-local. And all these problems are very, very interesting, not only from an intellectual point of view, but also from an application point of view. And I believe it's, it's actually good to step back and to realize that you, know, you have these problems that are uh, still waiting for someone to solve them. And uh, that's where I want to conclude. We've known only a very, very little fraction of what there is to discover. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Do we have time for questions? The uh, the randomness that you are looking 